And today, I'm so happy to be here, and I want to tell you about how you can find your destiny. Now, it's actually kind of a loaded question, because the scripture bears out the answer to a question like this differently than what we've heard. There's a lot of teaching in today's culture, and probably always has been, about how to find your destiny, how to find your purpose. There's a lot of discussion. I'm, I'm reminded of Star Wars when Darth Vader says to Luke, Luke, join me. It is your destiny. <laughs> we talk about destiny a lot, like why am I here? What's my broader purpose? And as Pastor Scott so aptly put it last week, that really if we focus on this kind of one great thing that I do, we might miss out on all the greatness of all the things that God has already given us. And it's better for us to, to recognize that we have many purposes, many directions, and many destinies. It's, it's good to ask the question, though, because the reality is we aren't here by accident. There is a plan. Psalms 139, you formed my inmost being. God put everything on the inside of you, in your soul, giftings, talents, desires, ambitions. He put them in you already because he planned you before the creation of the world. The God of this universe had already planned you to be born at such a time as this. And not only did he put you on the planet for a reason, to make a difference, he equipped you to make a difference. Not only did he form your inmost being and place things on the inside of you that you would need, but he also has equipped us with the life-changing word of God, the powerful sword of the spirit, the word that can move mountains. You have been equipped with what you need to be more than an overcomer. And if that weren't enough, come on somebody, get excited in here. He put his spirit on the inside of you. He put his Holy Spirit on the inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and dwells in you that we might walk on this planet as Jesus did with power, that we might be mountain movers. Come on, somebody. And then if that weren't enough, he said that you are a king and a priest and he raised you up with authority and gave you the name that you might use the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name that anybody that calls out the name of the Lord shall be saved. How could we lose? We're built to be difference makers. We're equipped. We're strong and powerful. We're not victims on this planet. We're not victims of our circumstance. And so it begs the question, okay, well, all that I have, why? Why am I here? And we find ourselves looking at our hero, David, for just a moment. I've been talking about him a lot lately. And David is just watching sheep in a shepherd's field when the prophet Samuel shows up to anoint him king. David wasn't busy looking for his destiny. He was simply being great at what was right in front of him that morning, doing what he was supposed to do. And what we find out today as I teach is that destiny isn't something that you find, but when you're faithful with what's in front of you, destiny will come looking for you. Give the Lord some praise right now. Let's go to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five is a story where Jesus has just kind of hit the ground running. He's just starting his ministry. And he asked Simon if he could use his boat to stand on and preach to the crowd on the shore. He teaches this message, and this man's name, Simon, lets him use his boat. And then after Jesus finishes teaching his message, he says, put out now into the water and let down your nets. And, and this is where our story starts, because Simon, he responds to Jesus this way. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught a thing. I like that he worked hard all night, saved hard all night. He worked hard all night. He was being faithful. And it says this, but we haven't caught anything. He did something that didn't produce. It didn't seem to matter. Right? It didn't, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't advance his story that night. But because you say so, he says, I will let down the net. So he lets down the nets, and he begins to scoop up more fish than the boat can hold. The nets are breaking. He calls over James and John, his partners. They bring over another boat. They're trying to haul in all these fish. The boat starts to sink, and Peter, or Simon, his name's not Peter yet, Simon falls down before Jesus, and he says, away from me, for I'm a wicked man. And Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. That's a change of everything in this moment. This is Simon's moment where his life changes, where, where suddenly destiny is revealed, that, that why I exist begins to start him down this new path of his destination. The Messiah has called him first, the first disciple to be called. And he starts to follow Jesus. And what's going to happen is, is he's going to see the lame walk. 
He's going to see blind eyes open. He's going to see death get up. Dead people rise from the dead. He's going to see, he's going to watch himself walk on water. Like everything's changing. We're in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus looks at him and changes his name. Simon, you're no longer Simon. You're going to be Peter. And I tell you, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in, in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What's he do? He says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Simon just got his name changed to Peter. See, Simon, you didn't even know who you were. You're not actually Simon, you're Peter. And so often we're like, well, who am I, Lord? And what am I here to do? And then you're asking the right person because Jesus is the one that can tell you who you are. And Jesus is the one who can tell you what you're going to do. Don't listen to what the world says you are. My, I remember my counselor in high school said I'd be an engineer. You know, the, the world's wrong about who you are and what you can do and what you should be doing. Don't listen to the culture of today tell you who you are and what you can do, what you should be doing. And so in this moment, Peter begins the path of his destiny, why he exists. And, I, and so then I kind of pose the question, what was Peter doing when this came on him, when, when he found his destiny, what was he up to? Was he reading the, the newest self-help book on five ways to find your destiny? Was he backpacking across Rome? To, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who I am. and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go find my, my, the reason I exist. No, he wasn't doing any of those things. It doesn't even sound like he was asking the question. He just got up that morning and went to work and worked all day, worked all night. He was just being faithful where he was. Faithful with what's in front of him. Pete was working the graveyard shift at Pete's Fish and Chips. <laughs> Didn't seem like life was going anywhere when all of a sudden this great opportunity happens in his life. And he would tell you this, he would say, you know what I found? I found that we don't find destiny. We just be faithful with what's in front of us. Find purpose in what God's already given you to do. And destiny will come looking for you. Be great at the job you already have. Don't be bitter at the boss. Don't show up late. Be great. Show up on time. My dad always said, show up early, leave late, charge for eight. Be your best with your spouse. If you're married, that's your destiny. If you have children, be great with your children. Those little destinies in your hand. You know the world wants to tell you that raising kids is just some kind of distraction. You don't need it. Chase your ambitions. Continue on with your dreams. That's where, that's where your, your life is. Not with your kids, but I can tell you this right now. If you'll just make your children part of your destiny and give them your very best, legacy is born in that place. Family is born in that place. Fulfillment is born in that place. Don't let the world reprioritize what's important. Make everything you do that's currently in front of you great and be great at it. Be great at the little things in life and you'll find that destiny begins to look for you. In 1981, my dad was working in the attics of Arizona putting in air conditioners, HVAC. 1981, he'd get up early in the morning, five in the morning and work till six at night, 12 hour days. Not really accomplishing anything that was advancing any kind of agenda, just putting in air conditioners. Being great where he was. He was also volunteering at the church that we went to as a youth director, leading the youth group. And the pastor took him out to lunch one day and said to him, we'd like you to start full time here at the church. And there was a small church. He said, you know, it doesn't gonna pay much. We can give you about $25,000 a year. Now my dad at the time was making about 50,000 a year working in the union in, in the air conditioning industry. And then said to him, and you might have to clean the building sometimes or just do whatever it takes. We just have to do whatever it takes at this church right now because we're still small. Would you like the job? My dad ended up taking that job. How did this happen? Because here's the reality is, is when he took that job, he shifted from air conditioning to pastor. And that pastor now path would lead him in 1986 to, to taking over a small church and that the pastor had run out on the people and, and they needed a pastor. So my dad took over that church and there was just maybe 80 people in the church and it was just a little building and, 
And then from 1986, it began to grow, and it began to grow, and it began to grow, and then and it, it soon it was, by, by the year 2000, it was one of the largest churches in America. How, does, how did that path happen? My dad never was trying to be a pastor. He didn't search to be a pastor. He, he didn't dream about being a pastor. It landed in his lap, but he had told God this when he was younger. Whatever you put in front of me, I'll do with all my heart. And so when God put this in front of him, he just did it with all his heart. And the truth is, is that it was a small door for my dad. The door of his destiny was a small door. If he hadn't taken it, we wouldn't be here right now. He and my mom's founding this church. It was a small door. Sometimes destiny comes to you in a small door. It wasn't this great opportunity. Hey, here's the job of your dreams. Here's the opportunity of a lifetime. That's not what it was. Sometimes that small door is the door to your destiny. Why? Because sometimes we have to become small so we can enter into greatness. Well, that's beneath me. That's beneath me. That's a slap in the face. It's an insult what they offered me. No, don't be so arrogant. Don't be so big. Don't be too big for your britches. No, be willing to go through the small door. John the Baptist said, I have to become lesser so that he can become greater. He's talking about Jesus. We have to all become lesser so that Christ in us can become greater. Somebody say amen to that. When Peter was asked to follow Jesus, it wasn't a big door. From our perspective, that's a huge opportunity of a lifetime. The Messiah just asked you to follow him. But from Peter's perspective, actually, Jesus was just starting and nobody knew who he was yet. It was a small door. When Moses came across a burning bush, it was a small bush. God would visit Moses and light the entire mountain on fire one day. But today, Moses is just walking around in the wilderness, watching sheep when he finds his destiny. He's watching his father-in-law's sheep. Forty years he has spent watching his father-in-law's sheep in this wilderness. And he happens and sees this small bush on fire. He walks over and it cries out to him, Moses, Moses. And then here it comes. This is why you exist. He's 80 years old. It's interesting. He's 80. Joseph was a young child when he got his dream. David was a teenager when he found out he'd be king. Abraham was 75 years old when God first visited him. Moses was 80. We don't find that age has a lot to do with when your destiny comes about, when it reveals itself to you. But here's what we do find out, that faithfulness is critical. Because Moses was being faithful. That small door opened up for him and he even said no to it a couple times. I don't want it, God. (laughs) But he walks through that small door. And if you were to ask Moses, what were you doing when you found out what you were going to do, why you, why you exist? Were you looking for your destiny? He'd say, no. I was just watching my father-in-law's sheep for 40 years, just being great where I was, giving my best. In fact, I was being great when no one was looking. And I was being great with something that didn't really matter. And I was being great with something that wasn't advancing my agenda, watching someone else's sheep. I'm not saying we shouldn't have goals. We should have goals. We should have plans. We should do these things. But I wonder if we're learning from Moses right now that maybe what we do doesn't seem to matter or maybe what's in front of you tomorrow doesn't make sense. I don't want to do that. That doesn't even make sense. I, wanted, I, I see in, in, in self-help books a lot, only do things that are advancing your story. Only do things that are advancing your agenda. Make sure you're moving in the direction of your destiny. But the scripture bears out something different. Moses wasn't really going anywhere in his life. And what he was doing doesn't really even make sense. It doesn't even matter. He's not watching his own sheep. He's watching his father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. Why, do, why does what we have to do have to make sense, though? <laughs> I was thinking about this. We do lots of stuff that doesn't make sense, don't we? Direction lights don't make sense. My son, I'm, I'm teaching him how to drive now, Logan, and... And uh, he's 15, he's got his permit. I changed lanes and he's like, Dad, you didn't use your direction light. And I said, well, we don't use our direction light in Arizona. (laughs) There's a reason for that though, because if you turn turn your direction light on in Arizona, everybody that's around you will now fill in the spot you're trying to get to. (laughs) Isn't that true? You turn on your direction light and the guy behind you is like, no, 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 you're not getting in here. You can't do that. That's like alerting the opposing football team of what your next play is. Yeah, halfback sweep. And you, you run the play and boom, you're tackled. No, you got to run the quarterback sneak. I just changed lanes and then turned the light on. We do lots of stuff that doesn't make sense. Shaving doesn't make sense. 35 years I shaved, but I'm out now. I'm done. 
I said no to the shaver. I've been delivered of that shaving demon. That's why all men, we unite in November. Every November, we say no shave November. Because we unite, we say no to something that doesn't make sense. And the rest of the year, we're shaving away. Pajamas don't make sense. You might find that odd that I think that, but they don't. As I get older, I find that like putting on clothes, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and that might sound funny, but like you just stop being as limber. I don't know what it is actually. If you put on like a sweater, you're like, ah, ah, you get done. I'm like, my wife's like, you want to go to the gym? I'm like, no, I just, I just put on a sweater. <laughs> and I, gotta, I still got to do socks. <laughs> Why would I take off all my clothes to put on pajamas? Forget it. Okay, let's, let's just go there, shall we? Let's say you order some cake. You're at a restaurant. And the waitress comes over and says, would you like some carrots with that cake? You would say what? No, why? Because you don't add carrots to cake, amen? It ruins it. Carrot cake is awful. <laughs> Pearl Jam doesn't make sense. The big 90s band. Because you can't understand them, right? What did you just say? But it's still better than country music, wouldn't you agree? You know what I mean? Like, look, we got to talk about hard things in this church. We do. We have to, be, we can't sugarcoat it. Whatever you do in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 says, Work at it with all your heart. It doesn't say just the stuff that makes sense. It doesn't say just the stuff that matters, just the stuff that's worth it or advancing your agenda. It doesn't say when everyone's looking. It just says whatever you do. Work at it with all your heart. Whatever's in front of you tomorrow, just be great at it as working for the Lord, not human masters. Since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. See, when it's not worth it, God's the gap filler. If you do more than is expected of you, God will repay you. Right? And that's the, that's the reward you want. That's the reward you're looking for. Well, they don't pay me to do that. Good. Do more than is asked of you. Well, my spouse doesn't blah, blah, blah. Good. Give more than, than, than is given to you. Be that person that keeps giving despite what you're getting. Be your best wherever you are. Moses would say to you today, be great when no one is looking. Be great at something that isn't advancing you. Be great at things that don't seem to matter. Be great when it just isn't worth it. Be great when no one is cheering. You see, all these faithful and small things is training you. When we become great at all the little things, we're actually in training to become great. This was Moses' training ground, watching these sheep. Because for 40 years in the wilderness, he watched the sheep in the same Wilderness, where he would spend the next 40 years watching the Israelites. And here's the reality is when he first started watching the Israelites, they cheered for him. He parted that Red Sea and everybody was cheering Moses and everybody was cheering God and the applause was loud. And it's easy to be a champion when people are cheering. But for the next 40 years, Moses would lead these same people who grumbled and insulted and booed him. And it takes a champion to be great when you're being booed, to not quit when it's just not worth it. Because Moses could have said, Lord, it's just not worth it anymore. I don't need this. But he didn't. Why? Because he had developed the inability to quit by being faithful in little things. Michael Jordan, sports legend, one of the greatest basketball players to ever live. One of the things that's great about him that's different than other champion basketball players is that he was playing at a consistent level whether he was at a home game or an away game. He was consistent, 29.9 points per game at away games, which was unbelievable because usually when you're being booed, you operate at a lower level. But Michael Jordan would play at the same level even amongst the boos. He was asked about this, how do you do this? And he said this. They can put it on the screen so I can read it. No player likes to be booed, but I use it as energy for me to continue to play hard. Where does a person learn the kind of tenacity to be faithful in the midst of that kind of adversity? They learn it by being faithful with little things that just don't seem to matter. And when you refuse to quit, when it's just not worth it on a little thing, 
you won't be able to quit anymore when it's a big thing. You, just, you learn the inability to quit. And God is looking for a Moses that isn't going to quit before he gives out a destiny like that big. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 35 says it this way. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. The response to being great with little things is big things. The way that you become great at little things is by seeing all the little things as big things. To see this as a gift from God. This is my purpose right now if it's what I have to do tomorrow. And it's my purpose from God. And in that, I become great. And what happens is destiny comes looking for me. Where I live, there are a lot of bees. I don't like bees. I don't know what it's about. Do you like bees? It's because you you just feel like they're going to sting you for no reason. I don't know why. And they don't, but you do feel like they're going to. And they walk by trees. I live kind of out in the desert. and bzzz, Lots of bees buzzing. Zip, 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 zip. They're so busy all day. 12 hours a day, I guess, bees work. For six weeks is their lifespan. And, and they'll produce honey all day long, every day. Just, bzzz, 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 just making honey. That they probably won't get to enjoy themselves because they'll die before they get a chance to eat it. 280 beats per second, their wings are flapping. Just exhausting. Running around, doing something that doesn't seem to matter. But I found out this about bees, that they're responsible for one-third of the food we eat. That's crazy. They're very important. I like eating. (laughs) And 75% of all the flowers that you see blooming are the result of bees. Because the reality is, while they're collecting stuff for honey, they're actually doing something inadvertently. They're touching all these different plants. They go from plant to plant to plant. And as they touch different plants, they're pollinating, they're producing. Walt Disney was asked one day when he had already built a a huge empire, why do you still come to work? What are you doing at work today? Walt Disney said this, I'm pollinating. You see, the bees maybe think they're making honey, but maybe they're actually doing something better than that. Maybe they're doing something bigger than what they thought they were doing. I wonder how many of us are actually doing something bigger than we thought we were doing. What I mean is, is it's not about what it is you're going to do tomorrow, whether you're making, installing air conditioners or whatever you're doing, like my dad. It's about the lives you're touching while you're doing it. Because you're touching all these different people. And as you touch different people, you have, the, you have the important responsibility of encouraging them, of being kind, of being great with people. You don't know if maybe you're just a little bit of hope that that person needs. You don't know that that coworker you're talking to, maybe their, their son has cancer. Maybe they have a daughter that's addicted and running. And you don't know how your little word, your little bit of encouragement, your example could be bringing hope. You don't know the difference you're making in the world that you're in. You're just being great where you are. And so I would encourage you, just keep being great where you are. Be kind to strangers. Hold the door for somebody. Give somebody a smile. Give somebody a little bit of hope. Be great with your boss. Be great with your coworkers. Be great with your spouse. Be great with your children. Be great with your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter. Be great everywhere you are. And when you are, destiny comes looking for you. In 1 Kings chapter 19 is the story of Elisha. And I'll close with this. This is the moment that Elisha finds out what he's going to do with his life. Now, Elisha is arguably one of the greatest prophets to ever live besides Jesus. Elijah's the one we think of being the great prophet, but Elisha was Elijah 2.0. He got a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Great things this man did in his lifetime that the Lord did through him. And this is the story of when Elisha finds out that he's going to be a prophet. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So he departed from there, Elijah. Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing the 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now that's that, kind of like that symbol. Elijah goes by and like throws his cloak on him. That means like, hey, you're going to be a prophet after me now. So come follow me. This is his moment. Everything's about to change. He left the oxen immediately. He knew what this was. He ran after Elijah. Please let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. And he went back and kissed his mom and dad. But he also burned the equipment that he had been using to farm. And he sacrificed some oxen and fed some people. He got his moment. Like, this is what you're going to do. And Elisha would follow this, and he would be faithful, and he'd be great. But if you asked Elisha, what were you doing when you found out what you were born to do? What were you doing when your big moment came upon you and your opportunity to hit you? What were you up to? Like, were you looking for your destiny? 
Were you reading the right books and searching the right places to find out why you exist? Were you backpacking across Europe to find out who you are? Elijah would say, Elisha would say, no. I just got up that morning. What did he do? Got up that morning and decided to plow the fields like I'm supposed to. Doing my chores. He even found out that he's loaded up this huge amount of gear that would need to be pulled by 12 ox. Must have been heavy gear to farm the fields with. That one of the ox of the 12 ox called in sick that day, figures. <laughs> and so he could have done what most people would do, like, well, I don't have enough to run it, so I might as well just stay home today and, you know, watch some Netflix. But he didn't. He said, well, I got, a, I got an ox down, but you know what? I'll, I'll just take the ox's place and I'll actually pick up where the ox should be pulled. He's pulling with the ox. Who is this guy? What was he doing? He was like Peter. He was working hard all night. He was being faithful exactly where he was. He wasn't giving in. He wasn't doing the easy way. He was doing the hard things. He was doing the difficult thing. He was, do he was giving extra. Beyond what would ever be expected of anyone, he was giving. And he would tell you the same thing. He said, just be your best where you are. Do your best with what you have tomorrow. And destiny will come looking for you. Give the Lord some praise right now. Here's my challenge. Be great in all the small things. Be great in your everyday purposes. See the things that are in front of you as great and gifts from God. See them as part of your destiny. Your spouse, your children, your friends, your coworkers, your job. Do everything with the best of your ability. Be faithful in the small things. Did you receive something today? Thank you so much for tuning in today. I want to ask you a question. If you were to face eternity today, do you know what eternity looks like for you? And would you have peace with Father God? Here's the good news. God has already offered the free gift of his son, eternal life, just by believing. You might say believing in what? Believing that Jesus Christ is the son of God who died for your sins and rose from the dead. Make him the Lord of your life today by saying this prayer. Dear Father God, forgive me of all my sins. And Jesus, I believe in you. You're the son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now find a great church to get plugged into.